can stand. And um, I'm sure we'll have more people come in as we start the class. And um, these 930 classes are important. Amen? Amen? And many times, you know, you have, they say that teaching is explaining and preaching is proclaiming. And you have to have both. Preaching is inspirational. Teaching is educational. You have to have both. You have to be inspired to move forward in your faith walk, but you also have to have education. Amen? Amen. So they're equally as important. And I say that because I know sometimes as humans we fight the urge. Some people have the concept that, well, I'll just make the 1045 service. Well, this is... This isn't really a service. The 930 is more classes. It's educational. So it's important that all of us see the need to be educated in spiritual things. And I say that because we, we want people to understand that 1045 is the worship with music and the preaching. You'll be inspired. But these 930 classes are equally as important to your spiritual growth and to my spiritual growth. Amen. And so... We don't want people assuming that they can pick and choose. I mean, obviously, this is America. They can pick and choose. But we don't want them to think that this class is just the same as the 1045 because it's not. Right? There's two different, two different structured, intentional equipping sessions. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? So while the kids are in Sunday school, the adults are in here, and we're getting edumacated. Edumacated in spiritual things. Amen. Because, you know, it's, you can have a lot of inspiration, but if you're ignorant, inspiration doesn't help a whole lot. Right. You can be inspired and still be ignorant. That's true. You can have a lot of energy and still be dumber than a box of rocks. Ain't that true? Yes. <laughs> Y'all know people like that. Or they got a lot of energy, but you're like, man, they're so dumb. They got a lot of energy, but, man, they ha they're just ignorant. How do they? So it's important, you know, we put a high value on education in our society. It's important that we're educated in spiritual things and in the Word. So I'm plugging this 930 class. And if you've got friends that go to this church that cut this class and don't come to it, you need to tell them, look, you need to be in that class. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? Because you're going to get tools that you can use. And, and a lot of times in a worship service, there, there's music and there's preaching. It, it's an inspired word for preaching and inspiration. So you'll take that word and go do something with it. Teaching, we slow down the pace a little bit in most cases. And we equip you. We give you a lot of information that you're going to need. That we might not have time to highlight in the service. Does that make sense? Yes. So they're equally as important. One is no more important than the other. Anytime you open the Word of God, whether it's being preached or taught, the Word of God is just as important. It does not matter, even if you don't like the presentation of the person. That's right. You wouldn't like a donkey talking to you either. But Balaam had to understand, if I listen to this donkey, it's going to save my life. Come on, somebody. I feel like I'm... You know what? And a lot of times we are so picky... We say, well, I don't like his vocabulary. It doesn't matter what you, here's the deal. Do you want to be saved or do you want to go to hell? That's what it's going to come down to. And we're getting ready to get in this spiritual awakening series. And the, and the God has been dealing with me and he's been stirring me up. And we had two kids get the Holy Ghost in youth service Monday night. But we've been chipping away back there. And here's where we're at in our culture. It's so easy for us to have a nice building and we can have great leaders and great pastors and great church. And we have a great church. But you know how our bishop is. You know what got this church here was the fact that we don't coast. We don't coast. So we're constantly pushing. We're not trying to demand and command people to do anything. We're trying to inspire them and equip them to become what God called them to be so they can live overcoming lives. I don't like being a loser. I'm not a loser. You're not a loser. We're overcomers. Lord, Jesus, speak to us today by your word. We need you. Say, I need you, Jesus. Say, Jesus, stir me. Say, don't let me leave this place the way that I came. Say, I need your blessing in my life. Do you need it? Do you need it? Tell the person next to you, say, God is getting ready to do a powerful work in your life today. Tell them. Tell them. Say, God's going to bless you crazy. Say, it, it's time for us to shake off the cobwebs and the dust. Because God's got, tell them, say, God's got big things for you. 
said, said, don't be settling for baloney when God's trying to give you prime rib. <laughs> you may take your seats. Hallelujah. We are dealing with spiritual awakening, and I'm watching the clock back here and up there for a reason. Spiritual awakening. Say spiritual awakening. We have to be stirred. It's so easy for us to coast, all of us. Present company included. I'm talking to myself. Complacency is easy. You just quit caring. Right? You just don't put forth an effort anymore. It's, that's what complacency is. It's like, well, that's intentional. Now listen to that. Isn't that, isn't that a lovely sound? It's somewhat annoying. Most of you are familiar with that sound. You battle it every morning. Yeah. And so you hit the snooze button. And in about five, ten minutes, you're going to hear that sound again. It's that, isn't that right, Brother Wilson? It's that constant nagging, get up, get going. Now, if I let this go for about five minutes while I'm teaching, y'all going to get real irritated. You're getting irritated right now. In fact, most of you hate that sound. It's like, you know it's there to help you, but it really drives you nuts. And, and the Spirit works the same way. Right? The Word of God works the same way. God has never been into us getting comfortable. He's always moving. He's always stirring. He's, he is life. He's the life source. So he's constantly provoking and stirring. Why? Because if he doesn't, we'll settle into complacency and we'll miss what he has for us. When your eyes are full of sleep and you're staggered into the kitchen looking for that first cup of coffee... Most cases, you're not, in, in most cases, you're not ready for a deep intellectual conversation. In most cases, you're just trying to get your bearings. Am I talking to anybody? It's just a constant hammering, right? Like, and people right now are like, okay, just shut it off, Rob. We get it. We get it. Just shut the alarm off. It's irritating me. I'll shut it off. But I wanted to make this point. Because what happens in our Christian walk is we'll have a lot of ups, we'll have a lot of victories, and then God does great things, and we're all guilty of this, and then we just start kind of settling in right there, don't we? And you ever heard this? It's kind of like they'll say, uh, I just, I want things to get back to normal. You ever, I've said that before. Yeah. I just, I just want to, my goal, I just want to get to a place where I can be comfortable. We've said that before. If I can just make a comfortable living, if I could just have some, com we're, always, we're always aspiring to, I want to get in a position where I can sit back and just chill out. And basically what we're saying is I want to get to a place where there's not as much pressure. I want to get to a place where I don't have to fight as much. Ever said that before? Or made statements along those lines? I just, why am I always fighting hell, Pastor Greg? Welcome to the walk of faith. Welcome to Christianity 101. Jesus said, in this life, you will have tribulation. He said, he wasn't trying to hide it, Sybil. He wasn't saying, oh, when you live for me, it's going to be rosy. And I'm going to dote on you all the time. And we're going to hold hands. We're going to sing, come by y'all. We're going to stand by the campfire, eat s'mores. You're going to love Christianity. Oh, there's a lot of joy. We have a lot of victory. But you know, I mean, when you sign on the dotted line to follow Jesus, you know hell's not happy. Uh, I mean, it's not like the devil's going to say, you know what? I'll just quit bothering you since you're so in love. I just love a romance story. You're in such love with Jesus. I'm not, no, 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 no. He wants ownership of your life. And, and when you pull away from him and you're born again of water and spirit, he is still fighting for control. And so we fight. Now, I'm going to make some observations about the annoying alarm clock. Everybody with me? Say, I'm with you. Say, I will not go to sleep. If you start dozing off, I'll just turn that bad boy on back. back. <laughs> the alarm clock teaches us this. It proves that you don't trust your body to wake you up. Now, we do have a body clock. 
But the alarm clock is proof that you don't trust you. Because inherently we know about our nature that our flesh loves comfort. Right? The alarm clock proves, and it's designed to make you uncomfortable and provoke you into action. Even if you use your iPhone as your alarm, it doesn't matter how pretty the melody is. You can, you can change your alarm on your iPhone. The little, the little one that comes in the standard is that little uh, xylophone. You know, three, four. 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 And what's funny is that's my alarm. If it sounds happy, but it still irritates me. It's like, it's like going, well, you have to buy you to get up. It's, like it's all happy. You know, it sounds happy. But when you're in the wrong state of mind, even happy things irritate you. But it's to provoke you into action. So I set mine, Wilson, mine set up like on the floor over by the wall outlet. So I'm going to have to get up. See? I'm going to have to get up. That's why, that's why they have wake up calls at hotels. Because most of you that travel, you know, I'm, I'm going to set my alarm on my phone and I'm going to get a wake up call. But I've had them mess up the wake up call before. Yeah. This isn't right, but I'm going to share it anyway because it's funny. We went on a uh, vacation. It was uh, actually, we actually went to see my parents in July and we stopped at a hotel and I got a wake up call and uh, I knew it was coming because my, my alarm on my phone was set before it. So I knew it was coming. So I think Sherry's getting dressed, Cody's in the shower in the hotel, and, and Carson's still laying in the bed, and I'm in the bed, I'm like reading or studying, and I'm waiting, and, and the wake-up call comes, you know, and when you pick it up in the hotel, it's that boop, 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 or it's automated, so it's just there, the phone rings, there's no conversation involved, right. it rings to wake you up, right. that's their only obligation to wake you up, so I knew it was coming, so it, <laughs> I, I pick it up, and I just had to do this, this is not right, Mama Silva, you've got to forgive me, but Carson's laying over there, and he's like dead asleep. And he's the only one that's still asleep. So I, I'm like, hello? Oh, yes, yeah, I, he's here? Yeah, he's here. He's here. I said, Carson. He's like, I said, the, and because, you know, so he, I'm sure he heard it ring, but he's still in this, like, I said, it's for you. He said, huh? Just, it's for you. Sister Robinson, I make him get up out of bed. He walks all the way around. He's like this. He grabs the phone. <laughs> and he's like, Boop. Boop. And I started laughing, Pastor Greg, like I got him, you know what I'm saying? Of course, his mom took up for him and I got in trouble. But isn't that what dads do? Didn't we have kids to aggravate them? Can I get a witness from the dads? Because you know you, can't, you can only irritate your wife so much and you're in trouble, but at least with the kids, you're like an authority over them. Now, you know, you've got some authority with your wife, too, but she can make you pay. But the kids can't because you're paying their bills. So you can basically irritate the snot out of them. Is that right, dads? That's why we had kids. We have somebody to pester. Now, the alarm clock gives you the power to ignore its warning, but at your own risk. You can hit the snooze button. You can turn it off. It gives you the power of choice. You can listen to me and get up, or you can ignore it and pay the price later if you oversleep. Number four, the alarm clock proves this. Listen to this. If you submit to it, you will stay on schedule and not miss critical appointments. And so God sends his word and his spirit for the same reason. Because number one, we can't trust our flesh or our heart to do the right thing. We are self-centered. And we love comfort. I'll say it again. We cannot trust our flesh or our heart to do the right thing. Because by nature, how we were created, we are self-centered. Number two, God stirs us and convicts us so we won't be comfortable in our position. He wants us moving. Why? To step in all that he has for us. But have you ever noticed 
that whatever your desires and dreams are that God gives you, it will not come on your terms. Does it? If you start praying, God, I want to see my family saved. I want, I want this blessing financially. I, I want this. I want to do this and that, and I want to reach my world. It doesn't come on your terms. Anytime there's a major revolution or revelation in your life, it's because you got uncomfortable with where you were. Anytime you got tired of your financial situation or your physical situation or the conflict in your home or you got tired of the job and you started praying for a better job, anytime you want to go to the next level of necessity, it will require that you and I do something different first. We can't pray for a harvest and then not plant seed. Not happening. It doesn't matter what the harvest is you want in your life. It requires that we get uncomfortable with where we are. And I believe I'm talking to a bunch of people that you've been restless. God's been really good to all of us in here. But I told my wife back in June, I said, you know what? I'm ready for a revolution in my life. I am ready to see God. I'm ready to go to the next level. I want to see God do some things I have never seen in my life. I I want a spiritual revolution, a business revolution, a financial revolution, a ministry revolution, a music. I, I started listening. And God has been starting to rock my world. But I've had to do some things differently. Because, look, God, like an alarm clock, sends his word and his spirit because he loves us enough to give us the choice to be lazy and coast. Like hitting the snooze. So he'll keep provoking and pushing and stirring. He's very patient. Thank God we're not in the Old Testament. In most cases in the Old Testament, he gave you one shot, and if you didn't do it, You were toast. Right? But thank God we're under grace, so he's constantly trying, Brother Perry, to to, to provoke you and pull at you because, oh, man. I've seen examples even just recently where the Lord would move on me to do something, Sister Marcelli, like just like that, and I would would wait about two or three seconds, and because I did, I missed something. And he wasn't trying to punish me. He was trying to teach me, look, you got to be more sensitive to where when I say it, if you will do this now, just to, and I'm going to open up all these doors. But, but if you keep waiting and waiting and waiting, well, is that, is that God? Yeah, I don't know if I can do that. And you start talking yourself out of it from a logic standpoint, and I'm fearful. I can't do that. Then you're the one that loses. Because he's trying to get us in a position where really we trust him more than men. More than the economists, right? More than doctors, more than, than the government, more than, than our own intellect, more than our own accomplishments. He really wants to be the center, right? Do you believe that? He wants to be first. Now, do we always put him first? No. We've got so many options, right? So he loves us enough, just like, you know, the alarm clock gives you the choice. You don't have to listen to it. You can turn it off. You can hit snooze. You can keep hitting snooze for like 10 times. But you'll miss opportunities and appointments. And God loves us enough to give us the choice to be lazy and coast. But here's the thing. It will never satisfy us. Have you ever noticed that? It's like, you know, you want to go to the next level. You want to see God do more. But you know, you're smart enough to know now in your Christian walk that for you to get to that level, it's going to require something of you. So then what you do is you're like, well, you know. Maybe I'll just wait a little longer because right now, man, things are starting to kind of even out, Sister Angela. And I, I'm just now, I made that commitment last year, man. God did great things, but man, it took it out of me. I was fighting hell. And I don't know if I want to fight hell today. Not this week, not today. No, I'm working a long shift. I'm not fighting hell today. We all get tired, don't we? Absolutely we do. And we know, we know that when God starts stirring us, it's going to require us to do something. Hmm. Number four, just like if we submit to the alarm clock and wake up, 
we'll be on time, won't we? And we won't miss critical appointments. Listen to this. If we submit to God's stirring and leading us, we will not miss his blessings. We will not miss divine appointments. However, we can miss divine appointments. We can miss blessings, and our destiny can be missed by hitting the snooze button spiritually. We had two, two young people get the Holy Ghost Monday night back there, and here's the thing. The last several weeks, you know, it's, it's, I know it's Monday night. We all come here on Monday nights. We're all tired. We've been working. And then, then you're dealing with the cares of life. And so you, know, you all know how it is. I mean, sometimes on Sunday morning, we're all, we're all tired. Sometimes you didn't sleep good the night before. And just the last few weeks, we talked to the youth team back to the worship team. And I was like, look, here's the thing. The bottom line is, here's the bottom line. We come to church to encounter God. Amen. In its most basic form. Right? This is about Jesus. Amen. It's called Christianity because Christianity has the word Christ in it. So that tells me that Christ has to be the center. Right, Brother Lane? He's got to, he's got to be, he's every, Christ is everything. So, so he has to be the focal center. So I told him, I said, look, and I told our musicians back there, I said, look, we got three and four songs, but I don't feel pressure to do three and four songs. If people come in and they just stand there and stare at us, I, and I've told the young people, I said, look, what I'll do, I said, if you come in here and stand and stare, I said, I'm going to stay on one song for like 15 minutes and I'll play the same four chords until you raise your hands. I'm not here to entertain you. I said, I'm not going to be here playing and singing and us rehearsing. And I, and I told him a few weeks ago, this is, this is what I told the young people. I said, look, I said, I'm starting to feel like the band, the musicians, and the worshipers, they're the only ones working here. I said, so when you come up to the front and you do this, I said, that's not happening. I said, and, and I said, so what we're going to do is we're going to have prayer. So we had prayer. We've been, we've been pushing, pushing, pushing uh, the last few weeks. And then Monday night, Cody told me, this was this Monday night, that when he was on the drums, he's had, had a vision. Now listen to this, a vision of a brick wall. And he said, as we were beginning to pray in youth service, the wall started cracking. Awesome. Hallelujah. He said, then when I looked over at Brady Sharp, but he was praying the wall started cracking more. Now, Sister Marcel, what happened was I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. At that, at, during this period, we're praying. And the Lord told me, he said, you get the musicians off the platform. And you have the young people, the leaders, go out and start, you lay hands on everything in the building. And I'm telling you, we had two kids get the Holy Ghost. And God gave us a breakthrough. <laughs> Look, that's what we are, Right? And here's where we're at now in our church. Our bishop, Pastor Marcelli and his beautiful wife, they have given, given years and years and years and years and sacrificed financially and in physically their, in their body and mentally to carry the load. So here's where we're at in this spiritual awakening deal. It's not up to them anymore. It's up to you. It's up to me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Oh, here we go again. Say, it's up to me. I want you to say, it's up to me. Say, look, this is my church. You got to take ownership. This is my church. This is my community. It's my family. They got to be saved. Come on, let's pray. So they got to be saved. Come on. Something's got to change in me first. Hallelujah. It's got to change in me first. I've got to get to where I decide I'm not going to just coast. That's not what saved me. You know what, what got you in the water to get baptized in Jesus' name and what got you to an altar of repentance and what allowed you to get in a position to receive the Holy Ghost is you admitted that you were tired of where you were living. Right? You said, I'm tired. I'm tired of my sin. I'm tired of the guilt. I just want to get washed. If they say that that water baptism in Jesus' name applies the blood of Jesus, then sign me up. Right. And we come out a new creature, and God does great things, and it's easy for all of us. That's why in the book of Revelation it talks about the, the different churches coasting and being lukewarm, and, being, and God is mad. Why? Why? Because he's like, I've given you so much, and now you want to act like it's time to retire. And you're 25 years old. God's like, no, I don't think so. There's work to be done. Say work to be done. Work to be done. And so for this week, 
And the next several weeks up until the only weekend we will not deal with this is the weekend that the tenants are here in that class. Every week we're going to be dealing with spiritual awakening. Why? Because we want to be awake. I don't want to miss what God's doing. I mean, here's what I want you to do. If you want more from God, raise your hands. If you want to see financial blessings in your life and you're ready to go to the next level, raise your hands. If you want to see unsaved family members and coworkers saved, raise your hands. If you're tired of hell beating you up in your house and you're ready to see healing virtue flow, the stripes that Jesus paid for your healing, and maybe your uncle, your aunt, your, maybe they're battling terminal illness and you're ready to see it happen, raise your hands. Oh, come on, let's all stand up. Let's all stand up. And here's the deal. Now you raise your hands in heaven and say, God, use me as the catalyst to bring a revolution in my life, on the job, in my finances, in my home, with my family. Say, God, use me. Come on, let's worship. Come on, that's it. Mm, thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. The Holy Ghost is here. You may take your seat. I got to move through this real quick. It's a terrible feeling to oversleep, be running late, and to feel like you're behind the rest of the day. You ever done that before? You're, I, I can't stand being late. In fact, if, if I see I'm running late, i got to call the person and tell them I can't stand being late. I can't stand oversleeping because have you ever noticed when you oversleep, you rush in the shower, it feels like, like your body's going forward, but your mind hasn't engaged yet. It's almost like I'm going through the motions, but my mind's still back there in bed. Ain't that right, Brother Wilson? It's like, it's like okay, I'm, I'm at the job, but my mind's like... Like slow. It's like when I fasted that time at, at, uh, in college. I did like a three-day fast. Wow. All I had was water. And I'm trying to go to class, right? I'm sitting in class, and I'm, I'm starving by like day two, afternoon. And everything was, I was like slow motion. Everyone's going, wah, 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 because I'm not eating, right? And so this girl opens up this bag of M&M's at the table, and everything was like multiplied like 10,000 times, like the sound waves. When she opened it, it was like, <laughs> not, not like, it was like, <laughs> and I'm seeing the m and You know what I'm saying? And then she starts reaching her hand in, and she's not going, like normal, I could hear her go, <laughs> it feels the same way, man, when you're dragging and you, and you, and you oversleep. Yep. Notice, 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 the disadvantage you have is you're not alert and cognizant. You're here, but this not here. That's a terrible feeling. And it happens to us spiritually too. Life, bills, work, obligations, family, chores, adversity, all of it, all of it takes a toll. And it has the capacity to make us heartless spiritual zombies. It does, doesn't it? I've been in church services where I was doing that. Yeah, we've all done it, right? The Holy Ghost is moving, and we're like, huh? kind of like whenever your kids get to be teenagers, like their brain shuts off. I need you to go out and do, huh? <laughs> if you could just go take the trash out, huh? You know what I'm talking about. Those of you who have teenagers, right? It's like, so you're like, okay, okay, I know you have a brain. Could you please turn it on? What? Yeah, exactly. And we can be spiritual zombies, can't we? You know what I'm saying? Come to church. We all do it. Because we're tired. Man. And even, even the, the Lord starts moving in the, in the sweetest of ways. And he's not even asking us to run, jump, and do cartwheels down the aisle. I mean, he doesn't ask me that. Maybe he asks you that. And so, just the small thing. like, And you know you should lift your hands. And it's easy to just say, uh, Huh? Because life has distracted us so much, right? 
I mean, you're battling in your mind because the jobs, you've got Monday on your mind. You know when you get home on Sunday afternoon, you've got to cut the grass. You're mad at the rain. You're mad at the weather. You're mad at Bob Breck at Fox 8. You're mad at everybody. You're mad at WWL. You're mad at the weather. And, 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 and so you're in God's presence, and all he wants to do, he wants to spend time with you. It's simple. It's not complicated. He wants your full attention. He wants mine. And look, even up here we can get distracted. You think that just because we sit in these chairs and we play up here, we can get distracted? Oh, yeah. yeah. I I can get distracted playing music to where I'm not even engaged in worship. Where I'm going through the motions. I'm just playing. And my mind's already at Dickie's Barbecue. Outback, outback, you know, and or bears. Hallelujah, that's a good plug for bears. And you're like, we've all done that, right? We come to church because we're wore out from life. Now listen to this: we can go through the motions, and our actions can be governed by autopilot, and habits can become holy rituals, and all the while our heart disconnects from pursuing God's presence. Ultimately, God. He's after your heart. He's after mine. See, he already owns everything that we think we own. He's not impressed with possessions or earthly acquisitions. Our greatest accomplishments may gain the accolades of men, but God is only concerned with holding our full attention. While we seek to gain attention from others, God requires that he and he alone becomes the center. And if we're not paying attention to him, it's because we're sleeping through life, ignoring his alarm clock. And it is certain that while we choose to sleep, time is slipping away. There's what's called the iceberg principle. They say that 90% of an iceberg is below water. Only 10%. And so what happens is, the example of the Titanic. When you see the tip of the the tip of the iceberg, the 10%, it doesn't look dangerous, does it? But you have no idea that the other 90% is lurking below the surface. And that proves it's not, see. It's not the 10% that people see. It's the 90% that God is after. It's the stuff that, that, that I can hide below the surface. And everybody sees how pretty the tempers, oh, that's a pretty ice, but it's a beautiful piece of ice. And, and I can fool people. I can become a, a Pentecostal, and I can go through the motions. I've been raising this. I mean, I, I've been in a lot of different churches. I know how to do the Pentecostal deal. But God's not after Rob doing the Pentecostal deal. God is after Rob, period. My obedience. Even when I don't like it. Even when it's not comfortable. It's the 90% below the surface. Real quickly, Judges 16. Judges 16. I'm going to move pretty quick, okay? It's just normal because I want to get to these points. Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in to her. Next verse. The Gazites, the Gazites were told Samson has come here, so they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying in the morning when it's light, we will kill him. Next verse. But Samson lay until midnight. And then he rose, took hold of the doors of the city's gate and two posts, and pulling them up bar and all, he put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Next verse. And after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now, now here's the deal. She's a prostitute. Background on Samson, he's a Nazarite. Took a Nazarite vow. There, Samuel and Samson in the Old Testament had Nazarite vows. John the Baptist also had one. A Nazarite vow could be taken by an individual who wanted to take it, but it had requirements with it. It was set for a certain period of time. You could not drink fermented wine. You were not supposed to eat grapes. Okay? You were not supposed to drink any strong drink. And during the course of this vow, your hair was not to be cut. 
You are also not to touch a, a, any dead bodies or come near dead bodies. Okay? So, but Samuel and Samson, they didn't really have a choice in this situation because this was settled with their parents before, as they were born. Are you with me? So they came up under this. Now, here's what's important. Uh, at the end of the Nazarite vow, they were to offer a sacrifice, and then the hair that was uncut was laid on the altar. And they would finish the sacrifice. So get this in mind. So really, he has no business, he has no business messing with these women. And you're gonna, you're, we know this story, but I'm going to pull out some things here that maybe we haven't seen before. They said, entice him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to subdue him and we will give you each 1,100 pieces of silver. Let's stop there because for sake of time, I'm going to give them the, just the synopsis of the story. Bottom line is, Here's Samson's issue. And this is where the whole spiritual awakening thing applies to us. Before this is over, Samson, be, watch this, because he chose to go to sleep on her lap, because he chose to go to sleep at the wrong time in the wrong place, he will lose his ability to see forever. Because the Philistines will, they, they ended up taking his eyes out of his head. Now, that's graphic. But this guy was having problems long before they took his eyes, Sybil. And it's because he didn't take his Nazarite vow serious. This is the same guy that also, if you remember in the Old Testament, he killed a lion and then later pulled a honeycomb out of the dead carcass. He shouldn't have been near a dead carcass. Are you with me? He had been so used to crossing lines that, that it got him in trouble. Because as a Nazarite, he was supposed to be separated and consecrated to God. I'm going to make some observations, and you just listen in. Samson's first problem was he got too comfortable with environments and people that should be off limits. He got too comfortable with environments and people that should be off limits. And I don't care how strong you think you are and how talented you are. I don't care how long I've been in church. There are some environments and some people that I ain't got no business being around. Let's talk about spiritual awakening. Because you can get numb to a lot of things and become desensitized. There's a lot of things that can come on TV, man. And they make a certain alternate lifestyle like, like it's funny and it's comical. And that's basically what they've done. If anytime Hollywood wants to push an agenda, they're going to get you to laugh at it first because they know if you start laughing at it, you start to accept it and it warms your heart up to it. And so, of course, the people that are not married and not you know, faithful and maybe they're not, they're not heterosexual, then what they do is they make that other lifestyle look like it's comical and charming. Right. The next thing you know, you're watching shows that promote a lifestyle that is contrary to Scripture. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yes. And, you, and, it, and it started because you were just laughing at it because the guy said something funny. Okay, but the guy is representing a lifestyle that by Scripture is an abomination. And you see, the more you laugh at it and entertain it, it could be anything that you begin to entertain, you'll notice what happens. It gets to where you tolerate more and more. That's our human nature. Now, now look, and I know you're like, man, you're, you're getting into some stuff. God is stirring all of us. It's like, okay, in other words, Samson got into trouble, Brother Pat, because he started tolerating environments and people that he had no business being around. And the dangerous thing is, man, he thought he was so strong and so gifted that he could excuse himself from it. Well, you know what? I've been living for God for 25 years. I can handle it. Are you sure? In fact, that's the deception. See? You're convinced you don't need help. You're convinced that you can handle it, and that's the whole trap. Because let him that thinks he stands beware because he's going to fall. Hey, I, I, honestly, 
Y'all know what it's like to be in an uncomfortable situation, right? Now, let, let's just talk nuts and bolts here, Christianity. Have you ever been in an uncomfortable situation and maybe something came on TV, maybe you were at a, at a, a, a place in public, something made you very uncomfortable, you started getting bad vibes. And you're like, I don't know, but something's not jealous, something's not right here. This, and have you ever stayed there, though, and overrode that? Okay, let's be honest. Sometimes we have. And then what happened afterwards? There was so much guilt, and there was this dirtiness you felt. Am I talking to anybody, right? And you were like, my God. How? And then you, you said, God, I'm sorry, I will never override that feeling again. No, no, as soon as that happens next time, I'm out of there. As soon as that person starts gossiping and talking about that person in leadership, I'm out of there. As soon as I see that kind of thing on TV, it's, it, we're turning it. As soon as I hear that kind of sound, it's out of here. Are you with me? Yes. Why? Because, you know, I, I'm trying. Look, I, we're not by perfect by any means, but we're trying to keep ourselves consecrated to God. Amen. Right? Because if not, if we start tolerating everything, we're going to sleep right through the alarm. And, and then it gets to where, see, there are some people that are such heavy sleepers they, they don't even hear the alarm. And the problem is, spiritually, you can become such a heavy sleeper, you're, you're so comfortable sleeping through all the alarms of the Holy Ghost that at some point nothing wakes you. Right. Then it's going to be easy to miss the rapture. You're going to miss the horn because you weren't hearing the previous alarms. God, help us. God is stirring us. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Number two, he didn't take his commitment to God serious enough, did he? Evidently, the Nazarite vow meant nothing. Ain't that right, Brother Sheik? I'm strong. I'm gifted. Look at me. He had no idea what he was messing with. Number three, his parents were delinquent and passive. God told them how to raise him. God was clear regarding his expectations for Samson and the importance of the Nazarite vows. And dad and mom were to emphasize the vows and remind Samson when he got off course. That's what parents are supposed to do. Right? When the kid gets off course, the parents are supposed to say, hey, I love you, but you're wrong. I love you, but you ain't doing that. Somebody said hello. They should have addressed his issues with ungodly women. His dad talked to him just briefly. He's like, you know, it's not good. You shouldn't marry her. But that was all he got. Yeah. Listen, listen, listen. They should have asked about the honey and where it came from when they were eating it. He took the honey out of the lion's carcass and gave it to his parents to eat. Yeah. Oh, I'm just so proud of that boy. He brought a Happy Meal home. Where did it come from? How'd you get this? If they would have heard it came from out of a dead lion, there should have been some issues. But watch this, because he's gifted and talented, they're not going to ask the right questions. And some parents are so enamored by their kids, they don't have the guts to ask the right questions. And I, look, I love my boys, but they know how it is. They know how it is. I better not hear them disrespect you. With the, I better not hear them disrespect you or you or you. I better not see them act inappropriate at church. I better not see it. I better not hear them talk bad about leadership. It's not working in my house. Uh-uh. Mmm. Mmm. It doesn't matter how gifted they are. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter how, how gifted I think I am. Believe me, my mom at 80-something years old, she still reads me the right act on the phone sometimes. She'll, tell me, she'll say, now, son, this is your mama talking, and you know it's coming. I'm not above rebuke. I am not above correction. Because I'm still wrong a lot of times. Mm. Number four, Samson thought his talent and gift excused him from obedience. No doubt, everyone, including his parents, were intimidated by his strength and they were in awe of his accomplishments. But wrong is still wrong. As strong as he was, Samson could not withstand the whittling away of his position by Delilah's words every day. Let me, let me tell you, that there's two things here. Let's all stand. There's two things here. Number one, Delilah begins to ask him, why are you so strong, right? We know that he played games with her, didn't he? He thought it was kind of funny. He kept messing with her. Like, and she told him, she came out, she said, I want to know 
What needs to be done to bind you? She was clear. Like, in other words, dude, I want to know what I got to do to take you down. She's told him, my intentions are, I'm going to hurt you. Now, where's the danger here? And this guy's like, he keeps playing with her. Like, he's, he actually thinks, you can't take me down. I'm gifted and I'm strong. So the Bible says that every, whenever he started messing with her, she started doing the guilt thing. If you love me, you'd tell me. The Bible says, now this didn't happen just in one day. You read, the Bible says that she urged him every day and pressed him to where he was tormented. She kept nagging him, if you love me, you have it. Every day, imagine hearing that, Shannon, every day, every day, every day she whittled away. Now here's the deal. If he knows what she's intended to do, why would he keep going back to her house? And that's our nature. We know when things make us uncomfortable. We know when the Holy Ghost is pushing and prodding us. But, and we know when things aren't good and we shouldn't do it, but yet our flesh still wants to do it because it would rather enjoy the pleasure even if it causes me to be tormented. So, Heavenly Father, I pray today, Lord, you're stirring us, Jesus. I've been feeling it, Lord. I, I don't, God, I have seen the cycle in my own life. I've gotten so comfortable sometimes. Man. Because I've been raised around church. I've been, I've seen people in and out of church. I, Lord, I, as a teenager, I struggle. Lord, as an adult, sometimes I'm still struggling in my faith. None of us have this all together. None of us have it figured out. And just because I'm the guy behind the desk up here doesn't mean I have the answers. Lord, I am fighting for my own spiritual sanity. I am fighting for every victory that I'm allowed to, like, take hold of. These people are, we're in a fight. And, Lord, I just pray, do not let us go to sleep at this juncture. <laughs> Lift your hand. Say, Jesus, don't let me sleep through that alarm. Say, I don't want to miss what you want to do in my life financially or spiritually or with my kids. Say, don't let me become a delinquent. Ah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Samson also lacked discretion because the Bible says that finally he told her all of his heart, didn't he? He told her all of his heart. He couldn't control his mouth. And we're in a day and time in society where that's our biggest issue. Everyone blasts, they blast each other on Facebook, they blast, they, they can't control their mouth. And that will get you in trouble. Samson's proof of that. Because the enemy, if he could get you to expose all your heart and say everything, the enemy's got you where he wants you. People can leverage you. Amen? Silence can never be misquoted. Thank God. Wow. Silence can't be misquoted. It's hard for us to stay silent. Sometimes we get mad at people. Sometimes we get mad at situations. I love all of you today. We're going to go in the name of Jesus. And look, don't, don't, God's going to be dealing with you in the service today and in the days to come about maybe some new commitments and maybe, maybe shoring up some things in your life. Look, we're all in this together, okay? We're here to help you. This church loves you. I want you to keep pushing. I want you to believe for God's best in your life. You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. You're winners. You're not losers. You're overcomers. You're victorious in the name of Jesus. And you will do all things through Christ.